Um, thank you so much. First of all, thanks to Lynn and Ash for inviting me. Can we give them a round of applause, please? Yes. This is by far the realest conference I've been to in life. Thank you. Um, so just to make sure we don't disappoint people, the power of open talks about open data, open source, open technologies, nothing else. So if you came here for something else, I'm so sorry. I, I have around 15 minutes worth of material and I want to actually tell you a story. And the story is about the commons, right? It's, it's going to be a family story. You're going to laugh, you're going to cry. Um, you're going to be happy, you're going to be sad. Hopefully you're going to actually want to do something at the very end, right? You want to act. By show of hands, how many people have heard of the commons as a term? Oh, quite a bit. This is awesome. Okay, cool. So for everyone else, uh, the commons is a term that is very popular in environmental sciences and sustainability, and it talks about that um, shared resource that all of us have to use, right? Uh, it's water, it's trees, it's land. Um, so let's get straight to the bad news and let's have fun afterwards. So the bad news is that there's a tragedy, and the tragedy of the commons is basically when you have multiple people using the same resource and they're using it in a selfish way for their own self-interest, and they don't care about anybody else, then that sort of resource gets depleted, right? And long-term, that's not good for anybody. Now, we see this happening on multiple levels, multiple times. Quickly a sample is, it is if you have, have trees that you cut down and you use the trees to produce paper products, they need to distribute them, um, and then you actually use them or consume them, and you get rid of them normally in ways that don't help long term, right? It normally harms you more. Um, that is the situation we have with, with the trade of the commons. People using stuff selfishly, not thinking about everybody else or anybody else, and depleting that resource to the point where we have no more trees in the very end. So I want you to, for, for a second, just not stand or step back, but just like lean back and observe two, two things here. Like one is that we've had this experience over and over for many, many, many times, many, many centuries. Like where we see the commons and people raiding the commons like regularly. The second thing is that we all here invest in the commons in the form of taxes. We all pool in our common tax dollars we hope that the government actually spends it wisely. We hope that they build stuff that is good and that benefits us in the long term. I'm going to refer to this as the digital commons from this point on. So you can call it whatever you want. It's, it's our money going to work for the benefit of all of us. The most well-known example of this is the ARPANET. Uh, OK, again, horrible. How many people know what ARPANET is? Perfect. All right, so in the 50s or 60s, the US government decided to do some research. Okay, what systems can we actually build that would actually survive a nuclear war, right? And thus was born packet switching, and packet switching is what the internet is actually based on. So the ARPANET evolved into the internet, and for a measly $124.5 million in the 50s, we have a resource that everyone uses and no one can actually do without, right? We have lots of billionaires. Any billionaires in the, in the room right now? Just, oh, okay. Well, if you can't say it publicly, just let me know afterwards we can talk. <laughs> it's fine, don't worry, I understand. Um, lots of cat videos, love cat videos. Lots of them created, lots of them watched. Um, lots of social good, lots of damage and harm because the platform and the people that built this platform wasn't very inclusive. We can all understand why. Um, and there's very limited investment in the commons for the good of the masses by the people that benefit from it the most, right? Uh, when is the last time you saw X company that's multi-billion dollar company investing in making the internet better for everybody, not for their own client base? Rarely. Uh, the emphasis right now is on shareholder value, which is 
horrible concept that became popular in the eighties because someone thought it would make them more money, like just keeping it real. So what we have is that we have an observed cycle of the first wave of the creation of these digital commons, where we have our tax dollars going into this common pool. We have our government officials who we trust defining military and defense problems. Uh, we have ideas being funded with our resources to solve these problems. We have some discoveries being made and then somebody having this crazy idea that maybe we want to take some of these things and make it available for non-military purposes. Who knows? And then people develop them and it gets delivered. Like the one thing that you should look at or notice here is that delivery does not actually go back into a redefinition of what the problem is or into the platform. Delivery goes off somewhere else. So let's look at um, more recent examples of this happening. The first is, is NOAA, which is the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. Uh, it's basically where everything that has to deal with surface temperatures on the sun to you know, a lot of whales making noises at the very bottom of the ocean. Like, NOAA tracks and has data on all of that. NOAA typically collects, well, this is from 2016, around 20 to 30 terabytes of data per day, right? Um, they just launched the satellite, the sea satellite is called GOZAR, which increases that or will increase it to around 400 terabytes per day, right? And that's raw and processed data. You start processing it, and you start doing it for multiple different disasters, and it gets to around four or five petabytes daily, right? All of this is open, all of this is available, however, it's very hard to understand and even harder to unpack. So every single weather app, every single weather person, every single weather company uses and relies on NOAA data, every single one. The, the interesting thought here is that you have an industry that's worth multiple millions of billions of dollars that is actually just using two terabytes per day of NOAA's data, right? The rest is untapped. No one actually knows what to do with it right now. But do you think any of these companies that are making these billion dollars are investing into the data infrastructure to make it easier? Okay, well, awesome, you know it. No, they're not. <laughs> uh, what we have is that people are afraid, well, not afraid, but they don't want to invest in something that may actually benefit somebody else, <coughs> right? So NOAA has this state where they're constantly underfunded. They also have this wonderful um, predicament, as most federal agencies, that they have to go through the congressional budget cycle. So the process is the NOAA administrators spend three months saying, this is the budget I need to actually, you know, make my operations go and, you know, hopefully grow. Um, they send it off to Congress. Congress says, nope, we don't believe you. We're going to slash that by half. We need, we need it to actually, like, make everything still run. We need it to actually, like, make everything run and to succeed, which is near impossible. So what you have at NOAA is old, unreliable equipment still in the field, still serving up the global weather industry. You have slow predictions, so um, secret. The three-day weather prediction is probably the most accurate you can actually, you will find. It's accurate to like 90%. Anything like five, seven weeks out, that flip a kind, right? You're gonna get a better result. Um, because NOAA was actually built on systems and architectures from centuries ago, not centuries, but decades ago, they, they basically have no way of actually producing easy to understand, easy to parse formats, right? So the barrier to entry, if you want to use NOAA data or build companies on it, is really high, which is why you only have like three to five companies in the world that do it and are making money off it, even though the data is there for everyone to actually use. Um, and finally, you have this scenario where the operations, given the fact that they have a very limited budget, they really can't sustain it. There, there's really no resource for them to actually grow long term. The second example, which is more relevant and the one I want to emphasize here, is 
the U.S. Census Bureau. Who here knows why the um, census was first done? Raise your hand. Why was it first done? Um, uh, for evaluating the um, um, share of political power among the states by population, um, which didn't actually involve um, counting all humans as humans. Perfect. Um, Non-PC reason, same exact reason. It was meant to ratify and implement the three-fifths rule, the three-fifths compromise, where they wanted to count people and they wanted to make sure that black people were counted as three-fifths of a white person. Um, first one was back in 1789, right? Um, fortunately, the Census Bureau has actually evolved since then. Uh, the Census Bureau officially opened in around like 1901 or 2-ish, so they've been doing censuses before. And right now you can access like over, if it's old, old stats, so probably over 500 different attributes on a sample of all Americans, and there are around 324 million Americans right now. So if you wanted to find out, you know, where people that were between 40 and 55 who were receiving disability benefits, who commuted five miles from work, um, who eat sandwiches at lunch, sorry, the sandwich part is, is not real. Um, you could actually find that information in census data, right? Again, they're free, accessible. This is the list of all, not all, but like the majority of, of uses for census data right now. So. Every single thing there is like pretty much important to each one of us living, getting resources, or having a life that we consider happy. If you, if you ask Alexa or Siri or search on Google or Wolfram um, for population or demographics, that's all census data. Um, they have the same funding problem because you know, they have to go through the, con the, the congressional budget cycle as NOAA, but it, it gets worse because like, when you don't have funding for census, it means that you have surveys being stripped, being eliminated, and you have products going stale, and you have entire communities that are not represented. So when they actually start cutting budget, like territories go, different counties go, different demographics and communities of people go. Like right now the census only has male, female, it doesn't have anything that would actually help you to get or acquire any of these services based upon the community that you identify with, right? Um, so this is, is really impactful. Um, so in this case, do you think any of the companies that are built on or use census data as your lifeblood contribute back to census? No. So you've already, this is my talk. This is, this is uh, the mix of it. The third example is going to be the the Bureau that counts economic activity, the Bureau of Economic Analysis. And they produce two main tools. So one is the GDP, which is a, the gross domestic product. And it basically is economic activity. So consumption, investment, spending, um, exports minus imports. That's a simple formula. And they produce something called the Regional Input Output Multiplier. So if you ever heard of some slick consultants saying, for every one job we hire in manufacturing in King County, we get a multiplier effect on the economy of 2.5. That is, that is the regional input output multiplier. That's what um, EDA does. Um, it incorporates census data, and every single app or financial planning analysis you do leverages this information, right? The exact same problems as the Census Bureau, the exact same issues, um, no reinvestment. And the final example is the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. Oh yes, I said that without stopping. <laughs> Let's just clap. This, yeah. this. So this is where I currently work right now. Um, it's called IHME. And it's a global public institute funded by the state and by a lot of foundations. It's in the School of Medicine in UW. And what do they do? So they produce data that quantifies health loss and informs policy as to how we can actually have people then live longer and healthier lives. Um, my horrible joke, and I, forgive me if it offends anybody, people ask me what I do, I count dead people. 
<laughs> it's true. Um, the data is used in everything from pollution control in China to healthcare spending decisions here in the US to nutritional program assistance in the Middle East. And you know, given all these uses, you'd assume that businesses would actually like want to help to make the data better. Not the case. So the entire talk is basically like, how do we actually move to an innovation cycle that looks more like this? Like we have to consider the, the commons, the digital commons that we're using and try to figure out how do we include them in our initiatives as a part of the way of, that we do business so that, you know, one, we can have better stuff. Two, we can be represented and included in all these data assets, in all these um, open source technologies. And three, we can just leave better stuff for the next generation so they can have the same things that we had. Uh, how many people knew that all these things were funded by your money? Like Tor, SciDB, Mesos, Spark, Julia. Raise hands. Oh, okay, well, two. So I mean, all of these things are in the digital commons. All of these things you own, you paid for, right? They're funded through your tax dollars. I just want to, to make like one simple request, so to speak. And that is, there is a plethora of actually sources out there for open data, open source technologies that the, that your tax dollars are actually paying for, find them. There's data.gov, there's DARPA's um, open data catalog, there's Commerce's data usability project. If you can leverage them, if you can use them, if you can actually contribute back to census or BEA to make sure that your voice is actually heard in their systems, in their data, in the stuff they produce, that your perspective is actually heard in them, that is tremendous. I think I personally have done a, a really not so wonderful job of actually making sure that happens, but I've, I've been trying to do my part over the last three, four years. Use these things, if possible, to actually build successful partnerships and build um, technologies that use all this old stuff, uh, technical word stuff, and help to reinvest in the commons. Like, reinvest doesn't only mean money, but if you do have money, see me afterwards, like my <laughs> Um, you can also just invest your time and your expertise and figure out how do you actually make sure that you're involved and you're in it, right? Be a part of the, the process and make this a part of the natural process for your business, reinvesting in the, the commons. Um, with that, I'm just going to open the floor for questions. Sir? So.